All right. I think I did this. I think I have successfully taken over the Word Bookstore's Instagram for a third day in a row. All right. We got some people coming on. Hi, there, everybody. This is, uh, this is George O'Connor. Uh, I'm coming at you at day three of my takeover of Word Bookstore's Instagram. Um, as we all know, we're living in very interesting times. A lot of us have been cooped up in our house. I'm writing, I'm speaking to you from New York City where uh, we're on a near lockdown pretty much. We can't go outside, school's been canceled, and people are learning from home. So I'm doing my little part I can here together with Word Bookstores just to bring a little bit of learning into everybody's house. Hi, everybody. I see a lot of waves coming. Let me just do some waving. Oh, look how big my hand looks when I do that. It's huge. Real life, my hand's not that big. So thank you, everybody, for joining me. Um, this is fun. This started out as just something I was going to do for, like, just pretty much one day. We'll see how it went. But uh, response has been really amazing. And uh, people have been asking for more and more. So um, I figure I'd officially announce here. I've said it a few other places, but really makes sense to say it here too. Um, I'm going to be doing this for every day at three o'clock for the rest of the week. So today's Wednesday. Join me here again tomorrow at thir Thursday. Today's Thursday. I have no idea what day it is. Is it really? Wow. Wait, what? So I'm only doing this for one more day? Wait, that's not true. It is Thursday. How did that happen? All right. So I guess I'm only doing it for one more day, so I'm doing it tomorrow, too, which, uh, wow, okay, that actually changes up my plan of what I was going to be doing. Okay, maybe I'll do Saturday, who knows? We'll figure this out. But yeah, so I'm doing this, talking at you. Maybe I'll just live online. You guys can see me all the time. You can see me, like, walking through my house, yelling at my cats, doing all the stuff I do, all those author things, those important author things. Who knows? So, uh... Welcome, everybody. I've rambled enough. I think it give you a chance to come on. Um, yesterday, I don't know if you were here with me yesterday. Yesterday, I did some talking about both um, Hermes, my favorite of the Greek gods, uh, the god of boundaries and borders, which obviously plays a lot into the world we're experiencing right now. And we talked a lot about his son, Pan, the god of wilderness and the goat god, who I reveal the kind of my version of him is basically just me with goat horns, if you were there for that. So um, I thought I would start off, I threw out the challenge at the end of the episode for people to uh, write a pean to either Hermes or Pan. For those of you who uh, are just joining us for the first time or didn't see the episode about Apollo, a pean is an ode, and an ode is a poem of that is a, a, a poem exalting a specific deity. And Pian normally applies to Apollo, but we're doing this for all the different gods. Pretty excited to say I got a really nice assortment of uh, letters written to... By the way, you should write these things to... Oh, kids at wordbookstores.com. They're actually really good about taking care of the mail and getting it to me. Some of the stuff that's been sent to me in other avenues uh, gets kind of lost in the shuffle. Shuffle. What's nice about sending responses to kids at wordbookstores.com is they have professionals there who take care of this and watch over it. So let me, if I may, share a few of the peons to Hermes and to Pan. Well, the peons to Pan and Hermes, because that's alliterative. That's more fun, right? Um, I'm going to start off this one is an amazing drawing from Shiloh. Let's see if we can get that so it's clear. It's a little hard to see because of the color, but this is Hermes. I want to point out his eyes are in shadow. As we talked yesterday, when you draw Hermes, you can't actually see his eyes because he is the god of liars. In my version, he always wears his hat pulled down over his head. You can see his golden helmet just barely in yellow. You can see his red cap. It's a pretty great drawing. But what's even more fun, and this is going to be kind of hilarious, um, Shiloh sent us a video of him singing his pian to Hermes. Now, this is going to be the most high-tech, low-tech moment you've ever seen. I'm going to play a video on my iPad and then hold it up so you all can see it. And I hope you're all ready for this awesomeness. This is Shiloh right here.
I mean, come on, that's the best thing ever. I almost feel like we should just end this episode already because I'm nothing I'm gonna do is top what Shiloh just did for us there. So Shiloh, everyone give him a round of applause. All right, that's awesome. I mean, the dance, he did a dance, come on. It's amazing. Let's see who else we got. Um, first I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures. This one has a very nice frame. Uh, pretty beautiful. Check out that awesome jawline. Good, good uh, smirk on Hermes there. That is actually, I should mention, that is actually from, I believe that's from Juliana. And then this is from Juliana's uh, sister, Nora. Check that one out. That's pretty great too. I mean, look at, oh, look at his chest hair. He's got some chest hair. Nice. Nice. Uh, and uh, there was actually, uh, there was an ode not a pian, they specifically said it's my ode to Hermes. This is written by Juliana. I'm going to do a dramatic reading. <clears throat> Dear Hermes, your speed is quite keen. Your deeds are quite mean. Most malicious indeed. Take your half-brother Apollo, for example. You take all his cattle and leave nothing for him. You are the trickster called Hermes indeed. That's amazing. Way to go, Juliana. Way to go, Juliana and Nora together. Uh, let's see. What else we have here? Oh, this one. This is... <laughs> uh, there's, a, oh, there's a lot going on in this picture. Now, this is from uh, Olympian superfan Maggie. And, like, I don't use that term lightly, and I'll show you why she's a superfan. I've known Maggie for some, some time now. There's a lot of fun details here. Unfortunately, they're backwards, so I can't read them. Can you step in and read some of the fun bits here? You stole Apollo's cows. That's clever. But he knows it was you. I hope you're still fast. <laughs> I love the moo. I love that, like, check out the little pan here. He's like, Dad, I want to play football. And he's like, what is he saying there? In a moment, son. Not just in a moment, son. He's like, in a moment, son. And there's this caduceus. There's a little sign in there, like a wanted sign for stealing his brother's cows. Um, this is pretty... Vote for Hermes. Oh, yeah, vote for Hermes, because he is the god of politicians, as we talked about. And this is, again, I'm going to show this. Uh, this was also said. This is evidence as to why Maggie is a super fan. Um... This is a picture from uh, a few years ago. This is Maggie showing up in full Athena costume to greet me at the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art Fest. That's me in the background. That's Maggie looking exactly like Athena as she does in the actual Olympians comics. So Maggie, thank you. Uh, that's another great one. Let's see what else we have here. Oh, <laughs> these are all series I love. Okay. Um, Baby Hermes. I mean, how awesome is this? I love this drawing. Like this looks, I mean, I would hang this on my wall if I had the original. Uh, and then also, look at this incredible Hermes. Like flying over the sky. It's like, you know, got shades of Superman, which makes a lot of sense because Hermes, you know, he's one of the most super heroic looking of the gods. He's got the cape, he's got the winged helmet, he's got some, that's a great drawing. Look how awesome that is. And then, um, Okay, here's, this is another super family. That is from uh, Meg, Nora, and Drake. I don't know the actual split of, um, of labor there because there's two drawings, three names, but check it out. This is an Olympian super family. They sent me this, an entire picture of the entire family. I'm going to say that's dad is Zeus because he's holding a lightning bolt. Looks like mom is Athena because she's got, like, look at her Aegis shield. That's amazing. And we have Artemis here, easily recognizable by her bow. And then it looks like uh, like Hermes there with this Caduceus in his helmet. How fun is this family? This is so cool. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, we'll just do a few more of these. We get, we unfortunately get more of these we can actually probably share. Oh, this is incredible. Um, this is from Anna. Look how good this drawing is. I mean, look at the character in there, and that's... She, you know, you can see how she's taken some of the stuff. Like, there's some elements here in combination with my Hermes, but she's definitely made it her own. She's made her own design. This is amazing work. 
So Anna, this is a great drawing. I love this. This is so awesome. Anna, one day you'll probably take my job. And we'll do one more. This is from Eleanor, writing to us from the Yorkshire, Yorkshire in UK. Look at that great drawing. She stuck a little bit closer to the lesson I gave yesterday. She also, look at her pen. Look how good this pen is. It's actually, if you saw my thing yesterday, this pen came out way better than my drawing. And I believe, well, this is the cutest thing. This is what we call buttering up. Eleanor drew, it looks like it's a book called George O'Connor, The Brave and the Bold. Two words that really don't describe me, but I love it. It's a whole little thing. What a great job. So everybody, I mean, I'm super touched. Yeah, I'm gonna get. It's such a great thing to be able to do something like this and to share and then to have people share their artwork back. And it's just, it's, it's amazing to me. Like just the stuff I get to see from this and thank you all. We're gonna, um, today, um, if you got, if you saw my little promos for this as we decided this would become a regular thing, I figured today I would talk about a couple of goddesses. And the first goddess I want to talk about is the goddess who probably more than every other goddess is overlooked. And um, conversely, strangely, I probably get the most mail about this goddess asking for when I'm gonna do her book. And this goddess is Hestia. Hestia, let's talk about Hestia. Um, if you know your Greek myths, and I'm sure most of you do, Hestia is the oldest, eldest of the Olympians. She was the firstborn. She's the eldest daughter of Kronos and Rhea. And she comes out first. She kind of sets the precedent. One of the things I think is really fascinating about Hestia, she sets the precedent for them to look like humans. There's, you know, we all know that the gods, of course, don't really look like humans. They look like big balls of energy, right? I mean, well, you maybe don't know they. I'll be telling that story in my upcoming book, Dionysus. But the gods, they don't necessarily take human form. They look anything they want. Hestia, the first goddess, she comes out and she takes this human form. But strangely, she's one of the least personified in Greek art. Um, almost all the gods have an easy to identify attribute, something that you could like point to like, oh, you know, the guy with the pitchfork, that's Hades, uh, <laughs> it is Hades actually, kind of the bident. The trident is Poseidon. Uh, the guy with the winged helmet is Hermes. Lightning bolt is Zeus. Hestia doesn't really have that easy to identify attribute. If anything, her attribute is she is a character, she is a woman wearing a veil sometimes and a demure expression. That's not super specific. When I came up with my version of Hestia, well, start, draw her eyes. Give Hestia very big, very large eyes. Now Hestia is the goddess of home and the hearth. And the reason I want to talk to her about her today is because, well, for starters, she's a very underrated goddess. And also, uh, home is suddenly a lot more of a place that we're spending a lot more time at than we usually would. It's really, home has always been the focal point of many people's lives, most people's lives I'd even feel like to say. Um, probably very few of us have hearths anymore. If you don't know what a hearth is, it was literally, it's a fireplace. And if you think back in ancient Greek times, the fireplace was not just the place you would gather around to have like, you know, to keep warm at night. It's where you might cook your food. It's where you'd gather around to tell stories. The hearth was like your television, your iPad, your dinner table, your heater, everything wrapped in one. It was the center of the home and she was the goddess of the hearth. And when I say she was the goddess of the hearth, I don't just mean like she was like, that was her place. It's like she embodied the hearth. Like she was in your hearth, like she was the fire. So I actually took that idea a little bit further with my, def with my diversion of Hestia, who doesn't have a lot to distinguish her physically otherwise. My Hestia is a figure who is wearing like a hood and is demure in her posing, but she's actually composed of flame herself. So let me finish drawing her face here. She's smiling. She's one of those good-natured goddesses. Drawing fire is kind of a tricky thing. Fire is the most, I, I challenge you to think of anything that moves quicker and more mercurially than fire. Who mercurially? I'm doing Greek gods to describe Greek gods. So you have to kind of give the, the, the hint of fire, right? 
Like it can't be the actual, you can't draw like the actual movement. So with her, I draw like these kind of flickering shapes. Like she's constantly just writhed and wreathed in flame. So in a sense, she's actually a very easy god to draw. I like these sort of drawings where you really can't even mess them up because if she comes out looking weird, you're like, oh no, it's just the way the flame was flickering at that moment. So that's kind of like my take on Hestia, but I want to address a few things about Hestia that I find, I, I, like, I don't want to get at one of the things, like people always asking me, when are you going to do a book about Hestia? When are you going to do a book about Hestia? When are you going to do a book about Hestia? Hey, are you going to do a book about Hestia? When? Um, I'm not. And I'm really sorry to say this because if you know your Greek myth myths, you know that Hestia only maybe appears in about four myths, like total. She appears in the Titanomachy, you know, the whole birth of the gods and the fight against the gods, but she doesn't really have a huge role in that. Um, there's a brief mention that both Apollo and Poseidon pursued her hand in marriage. There is another story, which I will not be talking about, about her and the god Priapus. And then there's like uh, maybe like one other story, which is not even a story. It just mentions that when Dionysus ascended to Olympus, she gave him her throne because she really wasn't using it anyway. That's hard to put a book about. I could make up a lot of stories about her. That's not really the way I roll in the Olympian series. I like to kind of really make... Oh, I just see somebody added, I think Hebe's overlooked. Okay. We just, there's one goddess who is more overlooked than Hestia, Hebe. But we'll talk about Hebe some other day. So, yeah, Hestia has this really weird role where she's this, like, like get this straight. She's a very important goddess. In ancient Athens, it was actually a law that you had to say a prayer to, he to he Hebe. I'm now I'm mixed up because I said Hebe. You have to say a prayer to Hestia before you said a prayer to any other gods, even during their festival days. It was always the first goes to Hestia because as the goddess of the hearth, as the center of the family, she was such an important figure. Like she had such vital importance to that. that like, yeah, you had to give her like props before anybody, even Zeus, right? And it was things like every time you had a meal, you would take a little bit off and you're sitting around that hearth, like I was telling you about, you take a little bit off your meal and you throw it to her as a sacrifice. She didn't have a lot of temples. She wasn't one of those goddesses who needed. She wasn't insecure like Zeus. She's like, make me a giant temple with statues bigger than the sky. No. She's like, you know what? Just throw a little food in the fireplace. I'm good. And I, my theory about why a character who is so vitally important in myth, I mean, well, no, not myth, in religion, but is so completely, almost totally overlooked in, relig in myth, is I think it's this. Myths don't always make the goddesses or gods look good. We were coming across this when we were talking about Apollo the other day, right? Like, Apollo was a beloved figure, and I couldn't think of stories where he doesn't come out looking like a jerk. And I think that was actually kind of the nature of myth. A fun story to tell, and myths were fun stories, were stories where there would be, like, just, like, kind of a lot of, a lot of shenanigans happen, things that were just kind of funny, things that maybe didn't, make the goddess or god look too good. She was so important and so beloved, they wouldn't tell stories about her because that would be disrespectful. She's Hestia. She's our goddess. She's the goddess of the home. Together with Hermes, she was the goddess you would have the most interaction with in a day, you would expect to. And so she was so important that they wouldn't make fun of her. Now, that's not to say she's not going to get her due in Olympians. I've maybe mentioned this here. I maybe haven't. But the 12th and final Olympians book, which I'm working on right now, is Dionysus. And um, she is going to be the narrator of Dionysus. Um, she's the first Olympian, as I mentioned. He's the final Olympian. So it's going to be this story where it's her with her greatest amount of wisdom is the first of these Olympians. She's going to explain what it was like to see the rise of this youngest Olympian. And I'm going to show you guys a little bit of the entry of the of the beginning to Dionysus. This is some rough sketches. Again, this is stuff I've not cleared with my editors. This is stuff. This is going to be. You're going to see here. Are you guys ready? Anyway, I should oh, oh, show you really quick. All right. This is like the first. I'm not showing you the first page of of like the the sketches. These are my thumbnails. This is what I do my finished artwork off of. This is page two and page three. We start off with some things we've seen before. There's Uranus. There's the Titans, 
There we see the Gigantes and the Nymphs. We see humans. And there's baby Hestia. And she's narrating this. She's, she's describing. And she's talking about, you know, her childhood with her father, Kronos, and her mother, Rhea, and how Kronos took her from mother, Rhea, and swallowed her whole. And then she's this little baby, and she's spinning through the darkness, and she gets older and older, and she's all by herself. And I want you to look at this panel especially. Now, that's a really rough drawing. This is the only time, or the first time, you see her throughout in this book, where we see what Hestia looks like when she's not wreathed in flame, when she's not covered up. And uh, it was kind of fun to design that. Like, what is this character, this most private and most secretive in a weird way of the Olympians? Like, what's her true appearance? And remember, her true appearance, of course, is a ball of energy. We talked about that. And she, one day, she finds herself no longer alone, but another baby comes through. And what does she do? She relaxes that human form she, that, that she had absorbed. She actually becomes this being of fire to keep her brothers and sisters warm and safe in the darkness in Kronos. This is some uh, top secret stuff you guys are seeing here. We see some more of her viewpoint. We see her first meeting with Zeus. If you've read my book, Zeus, you know Zeus gets swallowed as an adult. There's a moment, they just have a moment where they kind of match eyes and she's like, I don't know if I trust this Zeus guy. And that's gonna be something that plays out in the story. Everyone gets vomited out. There's not much to see in these drawings, but that's her looking, and then she decides, and this is a panel that actually appears in Zeus, where we see that she walks out of her own will. Out, she's the only one, the other gods are all vomited up. She walks out of her father's mouth, laying on the ground, Kronos, into the real world, and then meets her brothers and sisters in the real world for the first time. That's all I'm gonna show you guys, because that's some top secret stuff, but that gives you a sense. So, I mean, Hestia doesn't have a book per se, but you can see the first 12 pages at least are all about Hestia. Dionysus doesn't end up appearing to almost page 20. There's a lot of Hestia in this book. I get as much of her in as I can. And you saw the cover. The cover, I showed this on the first day, the cover is literally him kind of pointing at her. She's a very important character. So we're not going to have a book called Hestia, Goddess of the Hearth, but she definitely plays a major role in this one. So that's me talking about Hestia. Hopefully all you Hestia heads out there that's going to keep you a little bit happier. I do feel bad about this. I have a lot of guilt about these issues. Figure what I'll do now. There's another goddess I want to talk about today. Didn't seem right that we were talking so much about Apollo and not talking about his twin sister. Who, I mean, if we're going to be honest, I prefer. And I've been trying to tie a lot of the stuff in my talks about the different goddesses and gods into... Uh, actually their roles and the roles the way they apply to today. And it occurred to me, one of the things about Artemis that just makes her so perfect to talk about as we're going through these strange times, she's the goddess of wild places. She's the goddess of the outside. And the outside is a place that we're just not getting to experience the way that maybe we would like to. I know there's ways we could do it. You can go outside as long as you stay, what, six feet away from people and such. And this is temporary. We'll be doing some more, I mean, we'll eventually be able to like, you know, go out and enjoy the wild places in a way we can't now. But I think it's like really interesting and important to pay homage to Artemis, who is this goddess. The other things she does, which are also super important, especially nowadays, she's the protector of children. She's the protector of women. I mean, everyone can use protection as things get weird like this. So how about I draw a little bit of Artemis here? All right. Now, um, we talked a lot about this. We covered a lot of this when we were doing Apollo. Artemis is the elder twin sister, as much as such thing could be said to be true, of Apollo. Their mother is Leto. Their dad is Zeus. Their mother was extremely persecuted by Hera because, you know, troubles. And so she was chased to the end. Leto was chased to the ends of the earth by a giant snake named Python didn't let her rest anywhere until they found a, a puddle, not a puddle, an island that was kind of in a puddle, was like not quite dry land. She was born there. Artemis, like I said, came out first. Easy. Boom. That's why she's the goddess of childbirth. She made it easy in her mom. She understood. You know what? It's hard enough being pregnant. It's hard enough giving birth, especially when you're being chased by a giant snake and you're doing it in a puddle. So she's like, you know, I'm going to make this easy on my mom. And of course, her brother Apollo He's not the best about thinking about other people. So he's all like, oh, I'm going to stay inside a little longer. And Artemis's first act was to grow old enough to serve as the nurse for her mother. 
So she had to will herself. She's an Olympian. She could do stuff like this. She's a little baby, just squeezed out. And she's like, Whoa! and she grows up to, she's like seven in like a minute. And she's like, I mean, that's not that old, but still. And she like actually takes care of her like young brother as he's like fighting tooth and nail to not have to be born. Um, one of the things I've always loved about Artemis, and Artemis is one of my favorite goddesses, she really knows who she wants to be. Um... Not everybody can say that. A lot of people go through life just kind of fumbling along and whatever happens to them is what happens to them. Artemis knew from a very young age what she wanted to be. And my favorite story about Artemis is actually the one where she meets her dad for the first time. Because Zeus, not a great dad. He's not around for the first few years. And when he finally does, he's like, hey, uh, nice to meet you, daughter. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want? To, what can I give you? And she has like a list ready to go. She's like, okay, so here's what I want. I want like 40 Oceanides to be my maids. And I want like another 50 nymphs to like run through the woods with me. And I want a whole pack of hunting dogs. And I want like a special chariot. And I wanted a bow that's made of silver and shoots arrows. And oh, oh yeah, and this is important. I never want to be married. And I never want to have kids. Which is pretty much a slam on her dad, I think. She's like, because you're like the worst. And I saw how, what happened to mom. But I don't think he gets it because Zeus is not the most self-aware. But she has all these things. And she just comes out and she's just like, boom. And she knows it. And she sticks to it. Which is a very interesting thing about Artemis. There's a lot of myths where I kind of feel like she almost is interested a little bit in having a romantic partner. But because she has such a strong will and she has decided, she's like, no, I'm sticking to this. She makes a vow to herself and she sticks to it. And I can admire that. It's good to be open to new changes, but I think Artemis ultimately for her, she made the right choices. I can't imagine what sort of mom this woman would be. She'd be like, hey, go fight those bears, baby. And the baby's like, goo. She looks a bit like her brother. We talked about this the other day. Um, I get a lot of mail where people are like, wait, why do you give her blonde hair? She's like the goddess associated with the night and the moon. Shouldn't she have dark hair? I actually decided to make her a blonde because, well, Apollo is specifically mentioned in some ancient Greek sources as having golden hair. And I wanted them to be kind of similar looking enough that they're twins, but also an opposite. So Artemis, if you look at my books, is always colored in like she is in the moonlight, like she's it's night. Even if she's in broad sunlight, her colors are very cool, which is the opposite of her brother. Even if it's a night for him, he always looks like he's lit by the sun. She does not brush her hair because she does not care. There's a mess of her hair. Unfortunately, because I'm drawing live, I didn't leave room for like the most important part, a little hint of her identity. I'll draw it on here. This is not something I invented. This is something that you see in ancient Greece. She does, she's not the goddess of the moon, that's Selena. But she does actually get associated with her later on in antiquity. Pretty early on, actually, really. So you often see a little crescent moon behind her head. A lot of people, when they see my drawing of her, they think it's actually devil horns. Nah, it's a little horn she's got behind there. Just to show her affiliation with the moon. So <clears throat> that's my take on Artemis. That's my take on Hestia. I don't know if that was any new information for you all. I mean, you did get to see a whole chunk of Dionysus nobody's seen, so that was kind of cool. Um, it's worked out pretty well that I've given you all an assignment so far. You guys have been delighting me with your illustrations and your peons. So today, I have a challenge for you. I think we talked about the importance of when you're making a, an offering to Hestia, Hestia needs to go first. Always Hestia. Draw me a picture of Hestia. Try maybe to draw what you think Hestia looks like underneath the flames, underneath the robe. Or not. Just draw my version. That's also good. You can just draw her when she's, you know, on fire. That's cool. But maybe give that an idea. Maybe write her a little ode. Doesn't have to be a full ode. It could be a line. Just like, Hestia, I appreciate what you do. And then, draw me an Artemis. You know, maybe draw an Artemis doing something outside that you wish you could be doing right now. Maybe she's going to school. Probably not. Maybe she's running through the woods. Maybe she's shooting arrows at people. Who knows? Maybe draw an Artemis. But like the two of them together, that would be really great, I think, right? If we have a little bit for Hestia and a little bit for Artemis. And send it to me, please. Oh, like, yeah, draw, like, what I mean... Hestia underneath like the flames and the robes. I mean, draw Hestia as a human. Unless you don't think Hestia's true form is a human. Because it might not be. I mean, we know it's not really. Draw what you think Hestia looks like. 
when you get it, when you draw it, please send it again. Wait, that's not the one. <laughs> Hi, tech. Send it to kids at wordbookstores.com. And um, I'll show it. I'll read it, the pins. I mean, that's been really fun. I think we've all been having a good time with that. Um, and now, I think it's time to open it up to just some Q&A. If anybody has any questions or answers. Have you ever read Lore Olympus? The first question I received is, have I ever read Lore Olympus? Lore Olympus, for those of you not in the know, is an incredibly popular comic on the web comic platform Webtoons. I've only read a little bit. And this is the same reason I don't read a lot of Rick Riordan and I don't read a lot of other retellings. I don't want to accidentally steal an idea from another person who is doing their version of the Greek myths. This is important. As a storyteller, it's your job to put your own spin on a story. And I'm going back to ancient Greek and ancient Roman sources. That's kind of the mission statement of Olympians, right? And so I do put spins in them. Like some of the stuff I thought of, like the, a lot of the stuff I just showed you about Hestia, like inside of Kronos, that's my own spin. That's something I came up with myself, extrapolating an info I could find in ancient sources and what I thought about her as a character. So I'll read a little bit of something like Lore Olympus or like Percy Jackson, but very little because it would be really bad if I accidentally stole an idea from them, not even meaning to, just a spin they had put in those ancient stories and use as my own. So... Unfortunately, one of these days, if I ever retire, I'll go back and read all this stuff and be like, man, this stuff's really good. But for now, I have to kind of really limit my amount I read. Will you ever do a story on Cersei or Selena? Oh, uh, well, we just talked about it. So will I ever do a story on Cersei or Selene? So um, if you've seen my other, um, my other streams I've done with this, I actually talked about how... After I finish Dionysus, which is the 12th and final Olympians book, I'm going to do a four book series of Norse mythology called Asgardians. And my plan as it stands now is after I finish that four book series, I will go back and tell stories about other gods and goddesses who are not Olympians and demigods and heroes, people who are not Olympians, but other Greek myths. One of the stories I intend to do is a story about Selene. As far as Circe, it would be pretty awesome to do that, although the, really the only source that she appears in, and it's, I mean, it's quite the source, is the Odyssey. And if you're looking for a really great comic adaptation that has some of the Odyssey in it, I recommend checking out my pal Gareth Hines version of the Odyssey. He did a fully illustrated Odyssey. It's insane. It's so long. It's fully painted. It's a comic version, and Cersei's featured in that. I may do Cersei. We'll see. Um, I also recommend if you're older, check out Madeline Miller's book, Cersei. It's like, so good. Did you always draw so well? <laughs> the question is, did I always draw so well? Oh, heck no. No, nobody draws. like. First off, thank you for saying I draw very well. Or, well, period. But no, when I first started drawing, I drew little blobs, just like everybody else did. Um, I wish that there was a secret answer, like you push a button in the back of your neck and suddenly you draw better, or it's like the way you hold your pencil. It's none of that. Unfortunately, it really comes down to drawing a lot. And total art lesson here, draw quickly. And don't be afraid to screw up, because I screw up all the time. I didn't leave her enough room to have the top of her head. You know how like sometimes you play a video game, you'll play like an easy level over and over again just to build up your stats? Like that's kind of what drawing fast and quick is like. And so, yeah, when I first started drawing, I drew like every little kid. It's like a little blob. I'm like, look, mom, it's you. She's like, that's very nice. But because I keep doing it, I got better and better and better. And now I'm like an old man who draws every day. So I've gotten pretty decent at it. And it's the nice thing is that you can just keep getting better and better as you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just reminded off camera that uh, something that I always carry with me, and I, unfortunately I'm behind a web right now so I can't show you stuff, is a sketchbook. If you want to learn how to draw well, grab yourself a sketchbook, take it with you everywhere you go, and don't be afraid to screw up in your sketchbook because it's called a sketchbook. Sketchbook was just handed to me and not a perfect work of art book. My sketchbook, I'm just going to throw a few pages. Here's a quick drawing I did. This is a, a scene from uh, Dionysus, clearly. There's Dionysus, there's a Maeneid, there's Salinas, there's some satyrs around here, there's a guy drinking. 
There's Dionysus pouring out some wine on the ground. There's a coffee stain. Uh, that's Ares looking cranky. This is Ariadne, who is a character that plays very important into Dionysus. But all these drawings, look, some of them, like this, this is the back of Hestia's head. This is barely a drawing, but that's okay. These drawings are filled with things, like these books are filled with things that aren't, they're not meant to be perfect drawings, they're just sketches. Give yourself a sketchbook. Don't be afraid to screw up in that sketchbook. If anybody wants to see your sketchbook, like, yeah, take a look at my sketchbook, just a sketchbook. It's not a perfect work of art book. Don't have a perfect work of art book. That just seems like a lot of work. What came before Gaia and Uranus? Ah, what came before Gaia and Uranus is a matter of opinion, depending on your source. The version that I have gone with, which is the Hesiodic version, is chaos. And chaos, we, in our parlance, you know, modern main, means like just, you know, blah, everything crazy. The Greek envisioning of chaos was actually a white void. It's debatable whether or not it was anything. Like, I don't think it had a personality, though some people have interpreted it to be a proto-god. There is... A specific orf offshoot, <laughs> I said offshoot because it's the Orphic versions of the myths. There's a specific offshoot of belief in the gods called the Orphic myths, where there was a god before chaos and stuff called Phanes, P-H-A-N-E-S. I was going to cover this in Dionysus because it's a little offshoot and Dionysus plays an important part in this whole version where they added a few other generations before the other before Gaia and such it's a little confusing and so it looks like it's going to be cut out i may be doing a comic exclusively for my website which uh that's a good point to put this up georgeoconnorbooks.com i might be doing a comic there but you know who knows? In the meantime, if you go to georgiaconnorbooks.com and you uh, put in your mailing list, you get sent exclusively a free Digital Olympians comic about Pan and Apollo and King Midas. That's the only place to get it right now. But I'll be putting up something else there soon, and this is a great place to keep in touch with me. So yeah, before Chaos, there was Phanus, but that's like a whole weird thing, and it was like a giant egg, and like, it's weird. We'll see if I ever get to cover it. Are Apollo and Helios and Artemis and Selene the same gods? Oh, okay. Well, this is... All right, so are Apollo and Helios and Artemis and Selene the same gods? No. But what happened... So um, I think a lot of us tend to think of antiquity as being like just one period and like nothing changed. Stuff was always changing, right? And so um, Helios is the sun. Selene is the moon. Like they were just, they're not just like the gods of, they are those gods. And in later antiquity, because the popularity of Artemis and Apollo kept growing, they kind of subsumed those gods. And I think they always maintained their own identity. But I think if you ask an average adult who the god of the sun is or the god of the moon is, if they even know who these gods are, they'll say Apollo and Artemis because it became, they became so popular. And that becomes because Artemis, as you mentioned, as I mentioned before, she was the goddess of women. And so she starts being very associated with the moon. There's a lot of reasons for why women and the moon are associated. I won't get into here. And then that, because she is the twin of Apollo, and Apollo was a god of brilliance. Now, initially, that brilliance was more like, I'm very smart, like I'm a creative type. But that version started bleeding over because of his sister's association with the moon into the idea of light into the idea of the sun. And then in later antiquity, which is where most of the stuff actually survives to us from, they became very closely related to the sun and the moon. Although we still hear mentions Helios and Selene both have their own myths. So it's not like they're completely forgotten characters, but that was a great question. Are your Olympian books meant to be read in order? Oh, <laughs> the question was, I guess somebody who's um, just introduced, welcome, just learning my series for the first time. Hi, welcome. Are the Olympians books meant to be read in order? No, they're not. I designed Olympians to be what I call a modular series. Um, that's why each one is aimed after a specific goddess or god, because you might be someone who has an interest in, Olymp in mythology and you're like, oh, look, there's a book here all about Artemis. I've never read a book just about Artemis. You could read that one first. It'll make sense. You might be somebody who's really into Aries. Kind of scary if you are, but if you are, you could read Aries first. That's fine. All the books are meant to be read in any order. Any details that you need to know are filled in very briefly. You can read the books in order. There's certainly 
a way that this story progresses that makes sense in a certain way, but I figured most people discover Olympians through libraries and places like that, or gifts, or very few people get the chance to get the books in orders they come out, compared to the amount of people who just get to read them whenever they get their hands on a copy. So I very specifically designed the series to be read in any order you want. Who is the most powerful goddess? Mm. Oh, I love this question. Who is the most powerful goddess? Well, there's a bunch of answers for this. Actually, if you've read my book, um, Aphrodite, that's kind of at the crux of it. I will say this conclusively, and I'm sorry for today, it's, it's, not, it's not Artemis. It's gonna come down to a three-way throwdown between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. And they each are more powerful in their own way. Athena is the smartest, she's really great at strategy, she's also the best fighter, so she's got that going for her. In terms of just raw power, like just however you would choose that, like whatever, like just pure energy she can muster, like Superman level sort of stuff, it's gonna be Hera. Hera is arguably the most powerful of all the gods that way. You could even make a point that she's more powerful than Zeus in that matter, just because she's more ferocious. But then, the goddess who whenever anybody asks me who I think is the most powerful of all the Olympians, my personal answer is Aphrodite. Because Aphrodite controls the power of love. And it doesn't matter how powerful you are, how many skyscrapers you could bench press, how many lightning bolts you could throw, however whatever you could do, she could make you fall in love with a turd. She could make you do anything she wants. So Aphrodite's power is kind of unbeatable. So yeah, like Zeus fears Aphrodite. He kind of fears Hera. He, I think he has a healthy respect for Athena, but Athena's too close to him. The only god that I would say he's truly, truly like wary of the power of is Aphrodite, because she could do, she'd make him fall in love with a used tissue or whatever. She could make him lick a doorknob, and that would be bad in this time and day and age. Why does Hestia have a flaming body? <laughs> uh, I made Hestia have the flaming body, so um, without giving, so... Because she is the goddess of the hearth and she was she's lacking in defining attributes physically otherwise. And as I read about her, I read how the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, when they would actually like worship her, they would worship her in their fireplaces. Like she was they would speak to the fire like it was her. I'm like, so she is the fire, right? Now in my book Dionysus, which you haven't read yet, but if you turned in earlier and you could watch, by the way, you could watch a repeat of this after I'm finished by just still clicking on the little circle at, at Word. Um, I talk, I shared a little bit of the first part of Dionysus, which she plays a major part in. And in that, um, she first has the flaming aspect to provide light and heat and comfort to her brothers and sisters in the darkness of Kronos. And then, and I didn't say this before, when she chooses to leave the, the darkness after everyone's sucked out when Zeus makes them throw up, <laughs> which is very funny, she saw something in Zeus's eyes. If you've been paying attention to my books, you know there's a recurring theme that Zeus has too much of his father in him. We always see his eyes with the star field. Hestia sees that, and Hestia loves everyone, but she looks at her brother Zeus and knows that he's dangerous in a way that she's not comfortable with. And she actually wreaths herself in flames as a way of protecting herself. Not that she thinks he would ever hurt her, like physically, I don't think he could. It's a way to protect her because she thinks Zeus emotionally is not great for her. So she wreaths herself in flames. It's like a mask that she wears to protect herself from the outside world. We have two more questions, I'm told. Any thoughts about some Roman mythology? Um, I get this question a lot. People are like, are you going to do a book in Roman mythology? And the answer is, I kind of already have done books in Roman mythology. And what I mean by it is this. Um, the Romans are really great at many things, building aqueducts, building roads, conquering people. They weren't great at making up stories on their own. They had, uh, we talked about this yesterday at length, they actually had gods that matched up pretty closely to the Greek gods. Uh, almost every single one in the Pantheon, with the exception of Apollo, they didn't have an Apollo, so they just took Apollo. They didn't make up a lot of stories about their gods, but they did tell some pretty good versions of the Greek ones. Have you all heard of Ovid? Like, I use Ovid, he was a Roman writer, he wrote a book called Metamorphoses that's like amazing how good this book is. And uh, I tell a lot of his versions of stories in Olympians, I use it as my source. In fact, some Greek myths, um, 
what's her name? Uh, Arachne, for instance, you know, the woman who made fun of Athena got turned into a spider. Uh, we don't have a Greek version of that myth surviving to us. We only have Roman versions. We know it's a Greek story because we have Greek art where it's referenced, but actual written down versions, nothing got through to us. So I am telling Roman versions. And the reason I don't have a Roman book is there are a lot of Roman only gods. Yesterday we talked about Fortuna. Uh, there's Janus is another fun one to mention. There's a lot of gods who are only Roman and not Greek. There's no stories about them because the Romans just didn't make up stories about their gods. They were very practical people. Not to say that the Greeks weren't. The Greeks were just too busy inventing, you know, geometry and like architecture and everything because they were the super people. But the Romans were just more practical. They didn't, it wasn't until later that they gained an appreciation for like the stories of the gods that they decided to go that direction. So Olympians is going to count as my Roman version. If you're really a big fan of Roman gods, just switch the names. I won't mind. And last question. If you were a god, what would you be the god of? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, if I was a god, what would I be the god of? Uh, I'd be the god of rambling on. Uh, no, actually, I mean, pfft, man, what would I be the god of? Like everything, okay. I would like to think I'm the god of like humility at least, right? There's things I'm good at, but I'm not the best at anything. And so I think in order to be the true god, I'd have to be the best at something. I could be the best god of being like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. What? How about you guys write in and tell me what you think I'd be the god of? Like it'd be very nice to say I'm the god of drawing, but there's people who draw better than me. Very nice to say I'm the god of storytelling. There's people who draw, who tell stories better than me. I'd just be the, how about it be just be the god of being ordinary schlub? Just like me. Oh, wait, what if I am the god of being an ordinary schlub? It's like, you're killing it, dude. You're really nailing being an ordinary schlub. So this is the time when I would actually like to, um, we're going to wrap this up. But the good news is, even though I didn't know what day it was when we started, I'm going to be back again tomorrow. And uh, this is the time where I'd like to uh, thank word bookstores for being the avenue that I get to express myself to you all in here. And here's some of the ways you could support word bookstores. You could buy a gift card. You could purchase books on their website. Like I've already done that myself now twice. You could buy a VIP membership with you're somebody who buys a lot of books. This is definitely a good move to do. You can just become a member where you just get some just general deals just for like just shopping at word. And then there's the word bound mystery box for a friend, which if you're just joining me, I'll remind you because this I think is super fun. The talented booksellers at Word will ask you a full few questions about what your friend is in, what your friend's into. It's like, oh, he's an ordinary schlub who's just kind of does things. And they're like, okay, we know exactly the book to get him. We're giving him a George O'Connor book. And they'll package it up with a bunch of gift ideas and stuff, and they send it to that person. And then you look like you're a super cool person who knows your friend really well and knows books. And like, Word did it. So if you're interested in that, check. <laughs> One of these days I'll get that right, folks. Do wordbookstores.com, go there. Uh, for the pictures I threw out there, please, if you're going to draw Artemis, if you're going to draw Hestia, if you still want to draw Apollo, if you still want to draw Hermes or Pan or any of the gods we've talked about previously, send it to kids at wordbookstores.com, please. And they'll make sure I get it to me. People send it to me other places. It's a little hard for me to access it online. If, actually, I guess if you want to send it to me and not have it be shown, send it to other places. But this is the way, if you want to see it shared, do, definitely share it with me. Again, georgeoconnorbooks.com. Man, every time. If you go to my website and you put in your name on the mailing list, uh, you will get a sent that exclusive dig, Ligil Jumpian's comment. Mm, guys original Olympians comic digital that you could only get there. It's the only place to get it. And for the final bit today, I thought I'd share a little bit about what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Now, actually, I thought today was Wednesday, if you were listening, until just a few moments ago. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about two things tomorrow. But I got this from my fan Opal. Can you talk about Aphrodite? I love Aphrodite. So tomorrow, join me. I'm going to talk about Aphrodite and one other secret god. All right. I'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.